everyone. This is Fish and Rice Stories from Japan. I'm Toby. I'm Andre. And today we have a new special guest on the show. Welcome, Rory. Thank you. Thank you for being here, taking some time to talk with you. I'm glad to be here. Today we want to talk a lot about like gambling in Japan and mm-hmm. all kind of recreational online or offline kind of money involving activities mm-hmm. in Japan. But first, can you introduce yourself a little bit more to our listeners? Who are you, Rory? How long have you been here? And why do you know so much about this topic? Fantastic. Well, my name is Rory. I've been in Japan about 10 years. Uh, I work here in the Human Resources Department. Um, but in my spare time, I can often be found at game centers and various other places in Japan and have uh, battled with that vice on and off uh, for most of the time that I've been here, uh, mostly regarding things like the crane games, the fairly mm-hmm. harmless kinds of gambling things that you find in uh, find in Is Japan. Is it considered gambling? Uh, we, we can get into that later, yeah. but uh, it's, a, it's crane definitely game, first example. Yeah, okay. it definitely lives in the gray area between that, but then so does, as we'll find out, pretty much all gambling in Japan has to kind of exist on the verge somewhere. Mm. Um, so why is that? Why is uh, gambling so on the verge? Is it legal here in Japan? Um, on paper, all gambling is illegal. On paper. On so that paper. that means the law in Japan stipulates that you are not allowed to use your money to bet on some possible chance. I don't know how it's formulated, but like on a chance to win more yeah. money. Uh, that's basically the way the law words it is that any kind of betting which is one for one person's individual gain, mm-hmm. where many people place a bet and one person is the winner and they receive everything, is completely illegal in the law. Specifically, a part of the penal code in Japan that most people refer to as Law 45, um, which just basically says that uh, any type of act like that where there is only one winner and no like societal or mutual benefit is gambling and that's illegal okay so according to law 45 was it yeah gambling is illegal and betting is illegal now Mm. for me one of the first things that shocked me when i arrived in japan you know you just walk down a very peaceful street enjoy some temples you smell some nice uh, fried chicken and suddenly you are like engulfed in the um, cloud of smoke and yep. your eardrums are being destroyed by the loud noise of pachinko parlors. Yes. So pachinko parlors, can you explain a little bit what it is and after that we can get into whether or not this mm. is considered gambling? Well, I think a lot of people are at least familiar with the machines or what they look like, but uh, to put it simply, it's a type of slot machine that exists in Japan where the premise of the game uh, involves shooting these little silver balls into a machine where they then flow down in between pegs with the idea of getting the ball into a specific pocket so or hole. a little bit like flipper. Exactly. Or if you've watched The Price is Right, like the Plinko game where the disc mm-hmm. goes down and you try to get it into, uh, into a certain hole. Okay. Yeah, specifically, um, it's kind of based off of an old fair or carnival game Um, which most people know as like Corinthians or Bagatelle, Mm -hmm. where little tacks are hammered into a wooden board and you shoot a ball and it comes down, Um, uh, which is how it originated. But from there, um, kind of during the big development of electronics manufacturing in Japan, especially post-World War II, that kind of evolved from like a silly little carnival attraction into like this huge industry that it is now. Now, when you you said slot machine, um, my first mind was like, oh, I see slot machines in casinos, right? You put the mm. coin inside and you bet on a chance of winning yep. tenfold or hundredfold the amount sure. that you've put in. It, so this is uh, legal in Japan? It, Yes, it manages to exist in a legal way. In, a, in the gray zone you mentioned yes, earlier. Yes, it lives in the gray area and falls on the legal side of things. So um, wh- why is that? How, how does it work? Well, uh, in that uh, Act 45 of the Penal Code, Law Number 45, there's one little clause that says if the thing you're betting for is a small novelty. The actual wording is Ichiji no goraku. Okay. A small small temporary entertainment, um, then it doesn't count as gambling. So since you're not directly interacting with the machine, pull the lever, press the buttons um, to make a slot machine turn, you're shooting the little balls 
to, you know, op operate something like a slot machine. So it turned into a business where they you you spend a lot of money, you're gambling a lot of money essentially. Mm. But by definition, they've kind of still classified it as a, yeah. a, a fair summer fair ch child's entertainment game, and therefore you're allowed to something like that. Or the fact that you are not gambling directly with money, but with these little. Uh, steel marbles, um, basically ball bearings that roll around inside the machine. Um, those are what you're gambling with. And they're enough of a, a novelty or a, a small enough thing that they don't count as currency, which is being bet. And then on the other end of that, there's sort of an exchange system which happens, which... So this is something that I've read about. I never knew if it was true. So if, if I may like steal the show here. Sure. What I read is you basically play with those little balls, mm. you maybe win a lot of them, and then you can exchange them for a price, like a stuffed animal. Yes, And that's then you right. go to another store and you sell them the stuffed animal and they give you the cash. That's correct. Um, that sounds like a loophole to me. It, it is exactly a loophole, and it's the loophole that makes it all possible. Uh, in that same um, kind of phrasing of the law, where if the thing you're gambling for is a small enough novelty, um, it doesn't count as gambling. Um, similar to like tokens or tickets that you would win in, ar in an arcade in mm. somewhere like the United States. Um, you trade it in for prizes. And it just so happens that one of those prizes, um, something they call a, a tokushu keihin, a, like a, a special prize, okay. um, is basically just a little block, which has no, serves no function whatsoever. Just a block. Yeah, except that you can take it to an, another business which typically is running next to the pachinko parlor and sell that back to them minus a commission for its value mm. in money. So because those two halves of the transaction happen separately, it slips through that loophole. You're gambling entirely in these little marbles and it just so happens that you can trade those marbles with a different business. And I, I believe that's also very profitable from a tax perspective from the government who's yes. like not so enticed to like shut it down because they probably make millions if not billions. Sure. Um, and that's true across all kinds mm. of legal or pseudo-legal gambling in Japan is that typically 30% or more of the proceeds are collected um, Sounds convenient yeah, to me. Yeah, either by... It's like a business model. It is. Uh, by the consumer, um, basically the consumer bureau, um, which is a part of the Japanese mm. government, or uh, lo like local or prefectural uh, governments or NGOs um, can run something like this. And because they're collecting some of the proceeds for a charitable or like economic cause, then it's not seen as quite as dirty in the image, um, which doesn't draw as much backlash. How expensive can get those uh, pachinko balls? Because I hear that, that there are different price ranges. Yeah. Can it get like super expensive or there is a cap? Not as much as a slot machine. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning, right, uh, to bounce on this, that it has to be small amounts for recreational yes. play for yeah. pleasure, right? Yeah. Uh, but I hear there are different yeah. ones, so the, it can be one mm. yen or... The most, I would say, you typically see uh, attributed to a single pachinko ball would be 10 yen, which okay, is the equivalent. The most. Yeah, one ball. Yeah, be the equivalent of, of about 10 US cents or a tenth of a well, dollar. When you walk past these guys playing pachinko, mostly guys, I'm stereotyping a little bit, they have buckets of them. Oh, right? sure, so absolutely. Hundreds just... or, or, or thousands of them. I mean, thinking about, you know, if you wanted to cash even, you know, the equivalent of 50 US dollars into these, you would be dealing with 500 of these little balls, which is enough to fill up one of those trolleys or the little buckets. And then you get the trolley, which you stack the buckets on. So somebody's always in there mm. getting lucky with just stacks and stacks and stacks of these things. But each individual one, which Probably is what you're playing with, 10 yen. is um, often the places will advertise uh, on the front of the store what denominations of pachinko machines they have. Okay. So it's like we have one yen pachinko and two yen pachinko and five and 10. Um, the advantage being, um, you know, if you're playing in tens, similar to a slot machine or high stakes blackjack or poker, you bet more, you have the opportunity to win more. 
but you also have the opportunity to lose it all a lot faster mm. playing that way. But some people who might have had a stream of a string of luck playing one yen pachinko at we'll another place will think like, oh well, you know, if I'd been playing ten yen pachinko, I could have won ten times as much. Or lose ten times. Yeah, <laughs> typically goes the other way. So we kind of talked a lot about like the pachinko so mm-hmm. far, and, and you mentioned there's other areas in the, in the gray zone. So mm. f- for me, one thing I, I can remember, I was traveling back in Hiroshima. It's already quite a few years ago, and while taking the ferry to this uh, what's it called Miyajima, mm-hmm. the beautiful island in front of Hiroshima, yeah, there was a station where there was boat racing. Yep. Uh, so these very small, high-speed, very functional boats where it's nearly like a jockey on water, right? Mm-hmm. That it's basically covering most, like just part of the body, mm-hmm. and to be quite small. And people were betting on this, and I've sure. seen horse racing as mm-hmm. well. So how about those? Is this not like more straightforward gambling? They are. Um, they fall into a category um, known as public competitions, um, which is koe kyogi in Japanese, mm-hmm. where the public can go and view a competition of some kind. Okay. Um, and then betting on that is kind of strange. Um, it's not like a horse track that you might see in the United States or elsewhere in the world where you go and you bet particular odds on a horse. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's the favorite to win might be giving, you know, two to one. So you get, you know, half or sorry, double or less than double what you bet only. Or, you know, a horse which is unlikely to win. Um, which might pay out 10 times as much as you bet. Um, it's done through a system called paramutual betting, where basically everybody buys into these tickets. Um, okay, how does that work? Um, basically, the, the ticket, again, has a small value ascribed to it. So mm-hmm. one ticket might be, again, 10 yen or something like that. And you purchase 100 tickets on a particular uh, racer or horse to... Uh, to win or to place, um, similar to, to racing elsewhere in the world. But that horse or racer's odds don't really play into your potential payout so much as everybody who, like a raffle, everybody who gets the correct answer or uh, who bets correctly um, gets a share of all the proceeds. Equal share? Equal to the amount they bought so of the tickets. percentage basically. the percentage exactly of all the tickets sold so oh. let's say there were a hundred tickets sold and i bought 10 tickets i get 10 percent of the proceeds back um which would be more than the what i paid into it um because obviously there's always going to be people who lost and basically their uh their bet flows into mm. the people who won their bet and then again 30 or sometimes more percent gets funneled into um, horse racing is typically run by the agricultural ministry um, in Japan. The agricultural. Yeah, okay. basically in charge of farming. Um, it makes sense, right? Horses. Yeah, exactly. Well, in a way, it um, does, and on, especially if the tax revenue from the uh, proceeds, uh, logically, yeah. would go back into the agricultural yeah. uh, infrastructure. Sub- subsidizes farming, and on paper, at least, um, when. Uh, this kind of legal loophole was created for it in the mid 20th century, kind of shortly after the Second World War. The idea was to promote the you know, successful breeding of horses, um, basically after the war. Mm. Um, so by racing the horses against each other, you find out which are the best. And you know, those can go on to- Sounds like another loophole. Yeah, can go on to sire the next and better generation of, of horses in Japan. Is the justification, at least on paper, of why the agricultural ministry needs to mm. basically be running um, betting and gambling. So in this situation though, you you actually win money, right? Because um, yes. the pachinko you were saying, we're not technically yeah. winning money. We win the uh, little metal balls, mm. which we can exchange for a price, which we can resell for yeah. money. But here, you win money as yes. a kind of global share of proceeds. Absolutely. Are there only s- other situations like this? Wouldn't you be able, with this kind of logic, to simply say, "Well, we can bet on football games or soccer games, and like just do the same and sh- like share the mm. proceeds?" And uh, technically. But the, the reason it is so easy to do with 
um, things like horse racing, bicycle racing, and boat racing are the are the three big ones that you see in Japan. Is um, there was another specific act um, in in the basically the law books in mm -hmm. Japan uh, specifically which makes that legal. Um, and I mean, it's it uh, you get into a much deeper and more like complicated territory talking about it, but like post kind of in the MacArthur and um, occupation uh, years following the Second World War, mm -hmm. um, the Japanese government wanted to put forward a lot of novel like entertainments for the occupying troops, basically to keep them occupied. Um, so while they didn't really I see. want to have betting and a variety of other industries going, they had to find loopholes mm -hmm. to make that possible. Um, which is uh, why kind of around 1948, you just see like a string of different laws, uh, also regarding things like lotteries and other stuff like that, all got put into place right around then of like, well, gambling is still illegal, but we could make it a little bit less illegal. Yeah, but lo lotteries are everywhere, right? Takarakuji yeah. or at the, in front of my supermarket, yeah. uh, there's just a, the booth where there's always a lady sitting until 6 p.m. sharp <clears> and she sells you all kinds of different tickets yep. for, uh, well, buying lottery tickets, mm. basically, right? So this is pretty straight uh, chance, like you gambling yes. money for a chance at mm. uh, the big jackpot. Yeah. Right? The, that one is similarly... Um, there is a separate law in Japan which um, codifies kind of the way in which lotteries can be operated legally in Japan. Um, and again, there's sort of a bit of nuance in the naming of of that the takarak, uh, takarakuji, the you know uh, prize raffle mm. or the treasure raffle, you might say, um, in Japan, where the correct word for what we understand as a lottery would be um, tomi kuji, the, okay. the kanji for rich or fortune. Oh, I see. Um, which would be a lottery where everybody pays for a ticket and the winner or one jackpot winner takes all of the proceeds of that. Mm. Um, okay. So compared to uh, the United States or Canada, which is kind of where my experience is from, where you might have a rolling jackpot, which gets bigger and bigger each week or might vary depending on how many people bought tickets because you're basically splitting the price of all the tickets mm. between the people who who won or giving it all to one jackpot winner for that person's sole benefit um the jackpots here tend to be a like a pre-prescribed amount okay. it's like you might win you know a uh, hundred million yen or a billion yen or etc etc and that's because um, the money is again being kind of parsed out very specifically, like the horse racing tickets, like 30% goes to the Department of Commerce okay. and this percent goes to charitable causes and the amount that remains, um, or a pre-prescribed uh, amount of that is given to the winner, um, which is the, uh, again, it seems kind of like a loophole because um, in that same Penal Code Act 45, um, Tomi Kuji, the you know fortune lottery, is quite explicitly illegal with some pretty big penalties on it. So they've basically just rephrased the different activities yeah. to make them. It's not exactly this Tomi Kuji. It's a different way yes. of winning money. Because one of the main concerns I can imagine the government has with uh, these, or at least I'd hope they have this concern, is. Uh, the risk for addiction, right? A yes. lot of people yes. may get addicted to gambling and just spend, overspend yep. their money, end up uh, poor or even worse in debt. I know there's a lot of stories because loan sharks in Japan as well. Yeah. You said earlier you have been to a lot of those places, mm. even if it's just for fun. Um, how easy is it to actually spend money and how quickly does it go away? Like if you spend an hour at the pachinko parlor or on a... Mm. Um, it really depends on the kind of game you're playing. Um, there are a few different kinds of what I would call game center mm -hmm. gambling uh, in Japan, which I would break down into um, like direct prize games where you're trying to win something which is being displayed in the machine, like the, the crane games or UFO catchers as they're called here. The 
medallion games, um, which use sort of a substitute coin inside mm -hmm. with a nominal value okay. that you, you put in to do a slot machine or make some marbles fall, or it's like a coin pusher style game. And then you have pachinko where the balls are going down inside the machine. Um, and with pachinko, your money can go away obviously very quick. Because um, you just put the balls and suddenly your bucket yeah. is empty and you need to refill a 10 yen the ball. Yeah. And the, the thing is, the more you put in, um, these machines are running kind of on cycling odds. So the more they're played, sometimes the more they pay out. So for example, if you were to take a small paltry amount of money, like, you know, 2000 yen or something, um, it would be gone in a couple minutes in the pachinko machine. In a couple of minutes. Yeah, just pachink, 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 and you'd roll the wheel a couple of times or see a little movie play or, you know, slot wheels would roll and you might win one time and get 10% back and then just as soon it's gone again. Um, but you'll find if you put a lot of money in, like you just keep playing, then you eventually, the machine is kind of hot and you start winning a lot. Not necessarily is more than- Is it by you, design? Yes. More, not necessarily more than you've put in, but it kind of, every time you spend, you know, the equivalent of $100 or 10,000 yen or something, and you're just about running out, you always seem to hit a jackpot very near to the end. And a bunch more balls come flowing out. You might even be like slightly above where you started at and you keep playing and it kind of starts to trickle down again. And oh, you might get another big win and it kind of stretches it out if you play for a long time. And then every so often you might hit a big jackpot or something and get two or three times what you put in in the first place. But for every one time that happens, you know, 10 times you'll just slowly bleed out and eventually you'll have none left. I would assume that uh, by design, at least this is uh, an, so it's an assumption I'm making, mm. uh, not necessarily for pachinko slot mas machines, but at a regular casino, the odds of winning should be random, right? By design. But it seems yes. that from what you're telling us, I don't know if there's kind of any official st studies done on mm. the topic, but by design, those machines at Pachinkos are made so that you become addicted to just playing a little bit more because you get an extra chance and you might yes. feel like you're... That's very dangerous yes. for the users. That's at the core of... Um, I don't know necessarily about the you know public sports and betting side of gambling in Japan, but those big three, the UFO crane games, the medallion games, and pachinko, um, the sunk cost fallacy, where you don't want to stop because mm, you feel you already invested so much and, and you feel like you're close to so a win, close to winning um is, so is right at the center of uh the motivation to play and um is very much built into the design of the games um for example looking at the the crane games which is where a lot of people get their start because they're typically placed you know right out front of those game centers or on the ground floor. So you've always got to go by so them. So by game centers, uh, you just to clarify for people who are maybe uh, mm. not so familiar, you're referring to places like the, the no, not existing anymore, Sega building yeah. in uh, Akihabara in Tokyo. Exactly. Or we have them all over the country where you have all kinds of uh, fighting games yeah. or regular arc arcade games. A rig, games what we would think of as an arcade. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so at the entrance of those, you find those crane games where you mm -hmm. put a coin sure. or a couple of coins or a bill yep. and you get a chance at grabbing something inside. Right? Yeah. Those are the standard crane games. Exactly. And this is gambling. It is, in a way. Um, not even in a way because you're putting money in without the guarantee of getting something mm. back. The chance of winning something which uh, may be or which is more valuable than the singular cost of playing for the chance of winning that, mm. which means uh, it's a game where you, you know, risk the possibility of losing the money you're putting in with the chance of getting something more in return. It's not a direct yeah. money to money exchange. And usually exchange. what ends up happening is you could buy that item in the store, but by playing to get it, you just overpay the price to actually get it. Mm. Usually, in, if you in, even get it. In reality, yes. Um, because like most uh, of those claw game toys, they're made by specific 
companies, manufacturers, which produce them very cheaply. In Japan, the quality can be very comparable or comparable to、um, something that you might get at the Pokemon Center store,、mm-hmm. for example, or、uh, one of those specific Sanrio. Uh, so they're like limited、Kitty. edition goods you can only get from the crane machines. Exactly. Okay.、Um, and in terms of the feel and quality, they're very similar to a store-bought toy or figure or things like that,、um, which would often cost you anywhere from three thousand to ten thousand or more yen to purchase new if you were to buy it from、mm. from a seller or a li- licensed manufacturer. But in reality, like most you know carnival game prizes. Uh, they're actually produced very cheaply, and so these crane machines、uh, you mentioned are where most people get their start in gambling here in、yes. Japan, because they are at the entrance of these game centers where a lot of young people as yeah, well hang、absolutely. out after school. And so, what happens there? Well,、um, the games themselves, or the prizes, the selection of prizes is usually determined by what's. Popular in terms of anime and and pop culture goods at the moment,、um, like nowadays you might go in and see like K-pop goods for、uh, popular K-pop artists. You might see Spy Family stuff everywhere because that's the kind of hot anime right now.、Mm-hmm. Um, video game related things.、Uh, I remember for a while it was all Monster Hunter, and then it might change and it's all Pokemon when a new Pokemon comes out. Um, so it it picks things that people who tend to go to game centers for something like a music rhythm game or a fighting game or something anyway would be interested. In. So they know their audience. Yeah, it's targeted、um, by the design. I- the idea is that you ignore them initially because you just want to go in and go upstairs to you know play、mm-hmm. whatever game it is you're good at that you like,、um, and you will eventually see something that you want that、uh, kind of tickles your fancy.、Mm-hmm. Um, For me, when I first got into it, it was Monster Hunter because that was ten years ago when、um, Monster Hunter Four,、um, Try and Four had just come out, and there were the Iru Cat figures, and that was the first thing I saw that I was like, I need, need to that. have that.、Mm. Um, and the、uh, attendants, the people who work there,、um, are trained to kind of help first timers win. Interesting. If, yeah, if you look like you're struggling. Or you've dumped a bunch of the machine and、uh, dumped a bunch of money into the machine already without winning.、Uh, they will kind of hover around you and help you out、um, to let you get that prize. How, how do they do that?、Um, they can do it by、uh, giving you advice of like aim here, pick it up this way or that way. Or even in some cases, they'll open the machine and move the toy to a more favorable position. That makes it easy to win. Do you end up actually winning? Then, yes, usually.、Okay. Typically,、um, if somebody is aware and watching that you're playing,、um, it might take more or less time or money for them to make that judgment. But they will eventually open the machine and basically put the toy in a position where it is almost impossible not to get it with your next try.、Mm. That that's basically them saying, "Okay, thanks for playing. You've you've spent enough already to get this. Here you go." Have、okay. you been in this situation、oh, where, where you went and this happened to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean,、um, part part of the strategy once you start to get very into those games, pretend to be a newcomer. Yeah, exactly. Is to seem very hopeless while actually being very miserly with、uh, your your spending. So make it seem as though you are just dumping endless coins into a machine when in reality you're just kind of playing now and then when somebody's watching、um, to try to. Trigger that sooner if it's a if it's a game that it doesn't seem like you'll be able to win on your own, but、um, that specifically plays into that sunk cost fallacy thing because aside from basically getting given the toy by an attendant,、um, most of them are designed in a way that、um, it, there's not so much a random chance of winning every single time. Like you're just gonna get it first try.、Mm. Some of the games are like that, especially the three claw games, which are popular. Recently, recently are just kind of on a random chance, but a lot of them is sort of like you're not picking up the toy so much as like pushing it towards、uh, the hole or、mm-hmm. the the kind of space where you need to drop it into to win the toy. So it's like、uh, it might take ten little pushes to get it, or it might take twenty depending on how good your aim is. But you will always eventually get there.、Um, So people tend to try a bunch of times, and they're often set up in a way that the toy kind of moves a lot、mm. the first couple times you push it. 
Like it, uh, it's wedged between two other toys, which aren't actually winnable. They're just there to kind of prop it up. And it might twist, you know, halfway around so that it looks like it's, oh, it's almost about to fall in, but there's one little ear or one little arm that's snagging They're it somewhere. They're positioned like this on top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then from that point, you, you just like, you know, doing whatever you can, you whack it with the claw, you try to pick it up, you drop it straight on top of its head, and every little time it inches little by little until eventually it drops. And that's carefully designed by the um, uh, the owner or the, the people who set up these machines as, well, for example, if they're buying these for 500 yen from the um, manufacturer, then you've it's got to take at least five tries for you to win it. Makes sense. Um, but you know, once you get stuck, you're so close to the edge, but it's kind of just... You don't want to leave and let the next person yeah, get it. Yeah, it's right there, and you feel like, oh, it's got to be just one more try. If I get it in just the right spot, it's got to drop. And this is how uh, people start getting into gambling yeah, in Japan. that's how that, uh, that seed of the sunk cost fallacy that's in all of those games kind of gets sewed initially for everyone is they see a toy they want and as a first timer they get a bunch of help and they feel like they got it really easily and they get that realization of like oh you really can win these machines and so they try again on their own sometime and they struggle a little bit and it might take a while but they still get the toy eventually and then you just find yourself unable to stop so we we see that like it's very easy to start spending a lot of money mm. And we see that it's very easy to get hooked on those. Sure. But especially those crane games, I would say it's a lot of younger people sure. may be tempted to it, right? Of yeah. course, adults may want specific figures mm -hmm. or plushies or yeah. whatever, for whatever reason they may have. But it seems like young teenagers after school might want to hang out a little bit and directly like their brains get hooked on those games. Mm. Is the government doing anything to kind of explain the potential risks of gambling i mean if you are uh, mature and you're like okay i have a uh, hundred dollars uh ichiman yen yeah i want to spend them for fun have a good evening uh, whatever you enjoy yeah. that's fine yeah but this kind of not being aware of being hooked onto those games yeah is the yeah is the government yeah. kind of trying to set up some rules to kind of frame the uh, this legal gambling sort it's of thing? it's tricky um, a lot of those uh, arcades and game centers have uh, like age specific hours where people 16 and younger can only be in there until 8 p.m. for example mm -hmm. and people under 18 can only be in there until 10 p.m. But that For doesn't example. prevent them from just coming back the no, next day. It doesn't prevent them from playing. It just uh, prevents them from being there for a particularly long time mm. or at an hour where they might be more likely to be unsupervised. Um, but because, because all of these exist in an area w or are allowed to exist basically because of a loophole made for like little amusements and trivial uh, games mm -hmm. like that, um, it's it's hard to swing kind of opinion and policy against them um, when, you know, it, the, the counter argument is always, well, oh, it's just a bit of fun and, you know, they shouldn't be in there unsupervised anyway with, you know, money to blow on things like that. If, if a kid goes and spends all of their allowance on a crane game, well, it's not a very smart kid is going to be the, the, you know, the counter mm. argument to that most of the time. So it can be difficult to to get effective action so they're not really doing all too much to not particularly do, do we see that uh, any trends in this kind of oh first before we jump into the trends maybe do, do you think this is for specific cultural reasons uh, that this kind of gambling has developed in japan uh, most notably pachinko mm. I, I do not recall the loud sound that you hear yeah. there the, the smoke, I have not seen this kind of gambling yeah. anywhere else. Horse racing, you can see it sure, all over the world. Absolutely. Boat racing as well. Uh, but these pachinko, so unique yeah. to Japan. Uh, what kind of cultural reasons can you think of? Uh, may I have mean, it, um, it falls back to, I guess, or it goes back to the kind of sort of kind of class within society that was most often gambling um, in, in Japan for... I mean, ostensibly at least um, nearly 1,500 years. Mm. The earliest reference I could find to um, basically bans or controls being put on gambling in Japan 
um, is uh, ostensibly at least from uh, six, uh, sorry, 689 CE. Okay, that's a long time. Um, basically, uh, towards a, a dice game known as Sugoroku, which still exists in Japan. Um, the modern version of Sugoroku is kind of like snakes and ladders, where you roll, oh, okay. you roll dice, and you move a you certain number of spaces. If you go on the ladder, you can skip um, some lines. If you go on a snake, you go down some lines. Not exactly, but um, each uh, similarly, each space might have particular rules oh. applied to it, okay. or you know, like a punishment, like a batsu game in Japan. So that's one of the mm. first gambling uh, yeah, records. Exactly. Oh, but record. the the traditional version of it, from what I've been able to see, is most similar to uh, backgammon, in that you're you're just kind of moving pieces towards a goal. Um, and yeah, that was evidently banned by the emperor at the time, Emperor Jito, um, in the third year of his reign. Uh, basically for just being a cause of too much violence and discord in the country. Sort of like wherever gambling happens, fights and drunkenness and general mm. disorder tend to follow. So it's it has, you know, for as long as there has been, you know, history and records kept in Japan, been kind of a bad attitude and laws against some sort of gambling. And yet it has always found ways to continue through little loopholes like that. Mm -hmm. um, during the um, you know the closed country, the, the Edo period, um, when they were only trading basically with the Dutch and the Portuguese, um, cards were initially introduced by the the Portuguese, um, and a game specifically called um, Oicho Kabu, mm -hmm. which is uses a deck of cards, um, which is very similar to the um, the cards that we're familiar with, like one through nine and, and Jack Queen King mm -hmm. Ace. Um, just with with some cards missing to be honest it kind of looks like somebody saw like one deck of cards like through a window mm -hmm. and did their best to recreate that um uh but you know they create a new game it's like okay if we're not allowed to play with dice and stones on a board well the portuguese have this game that they play they're not just making with all right. with paper and we're gonna play that instead and there's no law against playing with cards and paper so that's fine for a while until that mm -hmm. um gets a bad rap and some new laws come in and then it's got to kind of turn um and a bit of an anecdote but coincidentally that um oicho kabu game um which the name actually comes from portuguese that's mm -hmm. like oito is the word for eight similar to oh. ocho in in spanish okay and then kabu is like cabo which is the end in portuguese cabo is also like nine in the game Basically, if you have cards through like one through nine, um, so it's like eight nine, in in Portuguese is the is the name of the game. Okay. And based on that game and, and gambling thereof is where the yakuza get their name from. Oh, interesting. That name because um, oicho kabu is it's very similar to uh, blackjack, in that you have a limited number of cards uh, where you're trying to make a better hand than the dealer, um, and. Yakuza, which is one way of reading the numbers eight, nine, and three in Japanese, is just like it's a really terrible hand. It's basically it means worthless. Interesting. So it's sort of a self-deprecating joke for the Yakuza to call themselves that, because it's um, you know they've always been associated with with gambling um, and finding ways to to make it through those loopholes and to refer to themselves as like you know the losers in a, in a hand of gambling. So in a way, the, the kind of current situation is just constant evolution and adaptation yeah. to new regulations, mm. new laws, and finding new loopholes of how they can yeah. inter essentially entertain themselves with money. Yeah, how to gamble in some way and for it to remain legal. I mean, we had uh, Oicho Kabu for a long time, probably up to and after the Second World War, and um, Hanafuda cards. Um, specifically, yes. the the koi koi variation of that game um, lends itself very well to betting, um, uh, and so it was used as a gambling game for quite a long time, um, basically all through the 1800s Meiji period, up until the kind of early uh, 20th century, um, when since it's such a like traditional game with you know references to you know haiku and other kinds of um, like Heian period, very traditional Japanese court life. Mm -hmm. They kind of wanted to separate that from 
from gambling, which is why it kind of fell out of favor as a gambling game. Um, and then Mahjong was, of course, introduced from, from China. Um, from China. And similarly, since that uses um, the little sticks, which represent money instead of betting with actual money, um, you know, you make the your yaku hand, um, and that's worth a certain amount of points from the other people at the table. That again falls mm. into a similar. This is a game where we just so happen to be betting these little things, which just so happen to be worth money when the game is over, um, and so that extra step of separation. So far, all the gambling things that we've talked about and yeah. mentioned were all like physical things, yes. right? So now with uh, the rise of the internet and, and online gambling potentially being available, how yes. is this changing the gambling landscape in Japan and affecting uh, people as well? As far as I know, we we dis we talked about the fact that it's illegal, but for example, I know of friends who bet on soccer games overseas mm -hmm. uh, using uh, foreign bank accounts yeah. and and uh, they use like uh, bank accounts overseas mm. to uh, bet uh, on those soccer games or all kinds of games for that matter and what well, kind of goes unnoticed right because they don't use the bank account in Japan mm -hmm. and so on but what's preventing then Japanese people to to use online gambling and gamble overseas it's still technically against the law in Japan um, like those direct casino games like playing you know poker stars with real money or things like I don't know if people still play poker stars but you know the or those you know twitch casinos those sorts of things are quite explicitly still illegal mm. um, in Japan um, although casino gambling itself has finally moved into that kind of allowable gray area um, kind of at the end of Shinzo, uh, the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's uh, tenure as mm -hmm. Prime Minister, he uh, basically relaxed the rules a little bit to allow um, companies, um, resort companies, um, to make these integrated resorts, which basically means like hotel and casino, like in somewhere in Las Vegas, that sort of thing. Um, but with a lot of caveats, as always, like 30% of it has to um, be paid as tax and mm. things like that. So since internet gambling is still more or less unregulated and pays no tax in Japan, it is still completely illegal. So and within you can Japan, get, you cannot... Yeah, you could still get big fine. Potentially, I think it's potentially like five years imprisonment and a pretty big fine for doing it, which like a lot of young people are not aware of that. They see, you know, famous overseas streamers and stuff play on these kinds of games. Um, which is a whole other predatory uh, talk on its own, mm. but um, they want to take part in that, not knowing that doing that from Japan is still is still against the law. So I can't see that changing changing anytime soon because you know there's always those two conditions of making some kind of gambling legal in Japan, which is either pay a lot of tax on it. Um, to kind of wipe away the dirty image of gambling of like, well, we're supporting some cause or industry by doing this. And, you know, nobody's getting outrageously rich off of it. You know, just everybody is, you know, pitching in together. It's almost like paying your taxes or um, the, um, what is that? Jimoto noze? No, what is it called? Furusato noze. Oh, yes. Um, well, you pay your tax in another prefecture and in exchange you kind of yeah. get the delivery of uh, fresh vegetables or yeah. meat from that yeah. prefecture. I mean, obviously not as nice as that, um, but it, it kind of takes advantage of a similar image of, of your, you're just paying taxes in, in another way um, or um, to have some loophole in that specific part of the penal code, which it can slip through, like lotteries using basically a different name to refer to themselves, or um, things like pachinko dealing in very small kind of petty prizes, mm -hmm. which add up to a big payoff, potentially. Um, you did mention, uh, so it's changed and so online gambling technically not allowed at all yeah. and you risk a very high penalty mm. if you're caught one thing you mentioned while answering my previous question was um, Shinzo Abe the previous yeah. prime minister or previous previous prime minister changing one law to allow these kind of uh, resort casinos now yeah. we are here in Osaka and Osaka has 
uh, being granted the right to open what seems to be or is about to be probably the first official proper casino here yeah. in Japan, which is going to be built in the harbor area near where there will be the expo in 2025. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been granted uh, to a very famous casino chain. Uh, and so is this the law they've used to kind of build this? Yes, exactly. So uh, large casino operators overseas um, are able to uh, open these integrated resorts here is the kind of buzzword or, or kind of... It was still a very hard and long political fight yes. to get it approved, um, right? So th although they legally have the right, they still need yes. to get local approval from the region where they want to build it. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, it was not particularly popular when mm. it was passed. Um, not overwhelmingly opposed either. I think it was something like uh, 53 or 58 percent of uh, people in a referendum said that they like didn't want that particular law to be passed yet, I think was the wording. It was sort of like, oh, wait a little longer. It's, as it's sort typical of to so Japan, sort of, always wait yeah, a little longer it to was see what kind happens of first. Already half and half. Mm. Most people thought like, well, okay, you know, the Olympics were coming at the time and they thought, you know, bring in foreign investment, foreign money, you know, new sources of tourism and, you know, charge taxes on it. And, you know, if, if some people gamble away their life savings, well, you know, that just that they're spending it there rather than at the pachinko. So, mm. you know, same Pachinkos result. have been quite on a decline recently. They have. In fact, um, I know very few people of the current young generation who've even tried pachinko, much less uh, spend a lot of time there. For, for a time, at least, it was almost a given where um, kind of a working man of a certain age would either play mahjong or pachinko regularly um and by which i mean like after work most days or at the very least every weekend um and again ma mahjong is also on the decline um there used to be parlors everywhere, everywhere that now you could it's play very hard to see i, yeah, I don't and, even I wouldn't and know. most places that you go you know the average age would be over 50. so if now someone comes from overseas for the f maybe the first time to japan and yeah. kind of would like to have a look uh, we're not encouraging gambling yeah. here, but if out of curiosity you'd like to walk into a pachinko parlor to see how, what it's like, or uh, horse racing or mm. boat racing, do you have any recommendations for people where to go, at least maybe here in Osaka perhaps? Absolutely. Um, personally, I would avoid the pachinko establishments in general. I mean, as you've said, the noise is oppressive Just if you take it's crazy if you take everything else away from it and that's and the um, smoke it's a lot to smoke be aware yeah it's a lot, a lot of a lot of them now have shifted so that like uh e-cigarettes or the like heated tobacco uh cigarettes are okay but um like open smoking is not so but you know it's a building that's had people smoking in it since the 1980s so you you can't really escape the smell even mm. though not quite as much secondhand smoke as there would have been previously um, though there are some non-smoking pachinko places, but they would be pretty hard to find. But um, just the atmosphere is is not really enjoyable. Enjoyable. I mean, it's certainly something. Stand by the something... entrance, have a look inside, yeah. and exactly right. Um, if you want to try, I would say most um, arcades on the second floor will have um, a few pachinko machines, which you can uh, basically pay to play by. The hundred yen coin. Okay. So you put in a couple hundred yen, the equivalent of a couple dollars, and you know you get five hundred uh, little pachinko balls or something to play in the machine, and it will probably run out pretty fast. You know you're not going to be there playing all day with a couple hundred yen, but for the same reason, you also don't need to go and invest and deal with the hassle mm. of having your money changed into the into the balls. You can just kind of get a feel for it and turn the knob and see, see it, what see like. it all happen and scratch that itch and then be done with it. I would say um, as a tourist, if you want to do one of these things, that would be fun as a tourist. I would recommend the boat races are that sounds exciting. Yeah, quite a spectacle on their own and pretty easy to understand as you only really need to pick a racer and bet on them. There's none of the um, kind of fancy, more complicated um, 
betting who's finishing fourth and third. Yeah, and you basically just say, I think that person is going to finish in the top three and you're either right or you're wrong. And even if you're not there betting, um, you fun to watch. It's fun to watch. And you typically get a couple of tickets included in the price of your seat. So, you know, you go and you get a couple of bets comped by your entry fee mm. and you can take a couple of pots at, you know, this racer or that racer and maybe you do well, maybe you don't, but it's just something fun to see. It's a, it's a spectacle on its own. Um, and then as far as the machines or the, you know, the mechanized gambling, you might call it, um, I might be a little bit biased, but I'm still partial towards the, the UFO crane games. Um, because like I said, they're often kind towards first time players. Uh, and you know you have you stand a good chance of of winning something which you know ignoring what the you know manufacturer actually paid to make it or what the arcade actually paid to buy it mm -hmm. you can get something similar in price it's a souvenir in a way as to a something that you would buy at the Pokemon Center or at you know the Sanrio store or Disney store that sort of thing um, and take it home with you as a souvenir um, which you'll keep if you are really interested in trying the actual, you know, become a zombie staring at the machine gambling in Japan, try the medallion games. Those are sort of a stop gap between the, the crane games and uh, pachinko. The level up. Yeah, they are the level up. In fact, they're designed kind of as a bridge to bring you from one to the other because they use these little silver medallions, which are similar in size and weight to a hundred yen coin. So having already got that delightful tactile addiction of feeding silver coins into the machine with the crane games, you can get a bucket of 500 of these little silver coins and feed them into a different game. Um, the reason I say that is um, it's pretty low stakes for the equivalent of about $10, 1,000 yen. You can get a pretty sizable bucket mm -hmm. of these things, which I would say is a, will last you about an hour. Um, okay, so you're uh, paying for your entertainment for yeah. one hour. Mm. Um, if you can call it entertainment, um, if you can call because it not, entertainment. not a lot happens most of the time. It's, it's typically like those quarter pusher machines that you sometimes see mm -hmm. in arcades, except using these little silver things. Um, and then if you knock enough of them off, you might activate a little slot machine or a little jackpot chance, which typically makes the machine open up and change and drop some balls into a little washing machine that makes something else happen or a bunch of marbles fall down or different things happen um, to show you, you know, what's happening in the jackpot chance, which is entertaining enough in and of itself. Um, but there's, there's no real chance of like winning big or losing big there. I mean, best case scenario, you win the jackpot and you're stuck with thousands of these little silver, mm -hmm. worthless silver coins, which you then have to get rid of somehow. Um, but that's, I would say, the the safest and most enjoyable experience of that side of gambling in Japan. Um, it's a good enough simulation. How much money have you spent yourself in those? Ooh, I, I that's, guess like that's UFO the, catchers is yeah. your favorite. Yeah, that's the question I've been dreading. Um, I typically don't count. Um, okay. Could you? What's what's your best guess? My, my, best I have counted before. The Wait, is this is your wife gonna listen to this? <laughs> <laughs> she, knows. she knows. Um no, at at the worst, which was when I was um kind of studying on an exchange um about ten years ago, I would say I spent the equivalent of about two thousand US dollars over the space of a year. Um That's quite a bit of money. Yeah, thinking that, you know, I went out just about every weekend and spent, you know, 5,000, 10,000 yen. Um, what did you get from that? Like how many toys or things you got from uh, that? Do you still have them? I still have a lot at home. Um, not as many as I did. Fortunately, I have a lot of like nephews now. I have three oh, nephews. So you were able to just, oh, <laughs> yeah. here's a yeah. present, um, present, present. Exactly. Um, Christmas present. Un Uncle Rory is always going to hook them up with another Pokemon plushie or Doraemon pl plushie or something. Justifying your addiction. Yeah, I have <laughs> I have endless of them. And I am, um, but you know, a uh, hundred or something like that oh, well, at, okay. at some point. Um, you know, I would typically go and win one or two things every time. Or if you go out with the intention of winning without particularly caring what it is you win, you kind of get into this hunting mode where you're looking for the machines that look the easiest 
and you kind of get a sense of like, oh, that little Snorlax plushie looks like about three tries. Do I want one? Do, oh. do I already have five of them sitting on a shelf at home? Yes, but I want that sweet, sweet release of getting something out of the machine um, is what it becomes. But when I think about that compared to, you know, saying, you know, you've, you've spent $2,000 on something which has kind of been your hobby on weekends over the course of a year, you know, if you're a golfer. Reframing it. Yeah, reframing. <laughs> This is, this is me telling myself it's okay. But like, if I were to say I play golf regularly on the weekends here in Japan and including my equipment and my green fees and things like that, I spent $2,000 in the last year. It's not all that absurd of an amount of money no, to have spent. Put that way, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't play golf, but as far as I know, the equipment costs much more than two thousand. Yeah, absolutely. The, the it wouldn't be yes. enough to buy yeah. all the equipment. Well, I mean, you if you if you buy used in Japan, um, and maybe we can talk about that uh, another time. Golfing, in yeah, Japan. golfing in Japan. Um, but like, you know, you could you spend fifty thousand yen on a used set of clubs, and it's about ten thousand yen a time to go to like a proper uh, golf course, or maybe like two thousand yen to go to. Uh, uh, what's the word, uh, driving range for uh, like an hour or two. Um, so, I mean, that that is a pretty expensive hobby that I've picked to mm -hmm. compare my hobby slash addiction to, but um, I wouldn't say it. I ever got to the point where it, it was becoming a problem. Negatively affecting your life. Yeah, that I, I, like I couldn't afford my rent or I couldn't afford to like buy food because I had to go out and, and play crane games. But there were certainly times when you'd feel like regret more than anything after going out and playing mm. where you know you walk in or you're walking by and think like well i've got 30 minutes to spare i might just you know throw a couple hundred yen in the in the and you spend ufo 2, catchers 3, and five thousand yen is gone and two hours and you know sometimes nothing to show for it you, you know, you get just too fixated or focused, laser focused on one particular thing and you don't win. Mm. And you walk out like, I am just the worst possible person. I Well, Rora, you're I definitely go. not the worst possible person. And uh, I uh, want to thank you very much for everything you've answered. I think Andrew prepared a little trivia for us. Okay. Before we jump into this trivia, I just have one last question sure. for you. And I wanted to kind of hear your take on with all the changes and how far gambling has come in Japan, what do you think the future holds for it? Is online gambling possibly going to be legalized? Are we going to see more of those casinos pop up? Are pachinko going to disappear? Mm. Your best kind of guesses or thoughts uh, on the topic. If it's going to happen online, it needs to happen on a site that's run in Japan. And controlled by the government. Yeah, probably, or, so. or at least is paying its dues, mm. um, which I think is definitely possible. Um, compared to some other game developers and things like that, uh, Japanese game companies have been a bit more reluctant to include things like loot caches and, um, uh, you know, betting for skins and things like that in games. But um, I can definitely see the things that already exist, online racing and stuff like that, um, for example, you've already got Uma Musume, mm. uh, which has just blown up in, in popularity in the last year, year and a half, um, which is basically based off of horse racing. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm not into that, so I don't know if there is any extent to which that app is, is performing actual gambling. Um, I would need to check with someone on that. But I can see something like that kind of being the transition. You take something which has fallen out of favor as being kind of seen as an old man's hobby and you bring something into it to rejuvenate it. You take horse racing and idol groups and smash them together and you get Uma Musume, which apparently is an incredibly successful, you know, uh, IP right now in Japan. I can see other people taking that lead mm -hmm. and thinking like, okay, we want to do online pachinko and we want to combine it with, you know, like online puzzle games or something like we're going to have, you know, puzzle it's dragons, like pachinko. Gamification yeah. of gambling. Game or kind of popification mm -hmm. of those gambling things. I think if Uma Musume continues to be successful, 
Um, We're going to see more of it. And things like that, we will probably see that expand. All right. Thank you, Rory. Are you ready for a few questions from our expert who's found... Uh, we've got some pens. We're just gonna scribble the answers okay. straight yes. on the paper. How so many questions do we have? Three, three questions. Three questions. I think it will be traditional for us. We had in our previous video also um, trivia questions. So this is three questions about pachinko. Okay. When was the first pachinko parlor established in Japan? <sighs> the closest mm. guess wins. Party? I Unless you will know. say. Year. I need a year. I've, I've got. I brought. Okay, so oh, the expert I guess first. goes. Okay. First, please. My guess is 1920. Okay. And my guess was 1947. Okay, it's 1920. Yes. On point. Yeah. <laughs> Very wow. good. Good job. No beginner's luck. No beginner's luck on this one. Maybe second question. Okay, next one. How many approximately pachinko <sighs> parlors are there in Japan today? So today is 2023. Uh, probably data is like 2022 or 2021. It's been declining. Yeah. I'm going to Let's say. Let's say last year. Uh, About, th- there is no exact number. Yeah. I think it's difficult to count. They're closing, opening new ones. I'll just say. Okay. Okay, the expert first. I would say one parlor per hundred people or so sounds reasonable enough. So I'm guessing about a million. Million, okay. And you're I wrote 1,215. Okay. Oh, a pretty big gap. I think, yeah, that's a really big gap. Toby's is closer. It's about 9,000. Nine, 9, I overshot. 9 million. <laughs> no, 1 million. 9,000. 9,000. 9,000. That's quite a lot. So 000. 1 in 10,000 people. That that does sound like a more reasonable guess. <laughs> okay, so it seems like Toby's was quite a little bit closer. All right, and the last question of the day. And uh, the last question, probably about two years ago, what was, or maybe approximately now similar, is the revenue of all pachinko industry in, or generated in, by pachinko industry in Japan per in, year? In yen or in US dollars? Um, let's say dollars. In dollars, okay. Or you want to go with yen? I'd I say have yen. No idea. Okay, you, I would let's say, say yen. yen. Okay. Okay, go with yen. <sighs> Ten thousand parlors, call it. All right, I have my answer. Doing math. <laughs> I just put a big number, lots of zeros. And say the average person spends about each month. Let's say about each oku n per year per parlor, which would be. Then I need to add uh, how many more zeros? Oh, he's got a lot more zeros than I do. Okay. Well, I can't change my answer now. Uh, assuming. Oh yeah, I forgot a few zeros. <laughs> I, I think he, he's killed. Okay. My guess is one trillion yen. Okay. What's your I've name? wrote what is it? Seven billion. Seven billion yen. Seven billion yen. Uh, here it gives. Uh, 2.4 trillion Japanese yen. Whoa. I sh- I undershot. You undershot, but quite a yeah. bit more than double. No, I figured but about yours, yours about one goes. one oku per pachinko place per year sounds kind of reasonable. But the other source gives two to three trillion, so okay. it's 2.4. Yeah, that's a lot of zeros. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot that of money. Still, rather... still a lot of money in it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory, for your time and Thanks this for having very me. interesting uh, discussion on uh, gambling in Japan. I certainly learned a lot. I hope our listeners have too. And I know that you've been wanting to talk about quite a few more topics, so we will gladly have you back in one of our next episodes. Thank you. For today, that's it. This was Fish and Rice Stories from Japan, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.